Aloha, Hello. everybody. Good to see you. Hey. <laughs> Aloha. Take your time to see everybody if you want on the other pages. It's good to say hi. Oh. <laughs> hmm. In the same way, we look at the quilt of Sangha members on the stream from around the world. Using that same observation awareness through the sense doors as we settle down. For example, at the eye door, trying to feel with body consciousness our eyeballs. And if our eyes are open to connect with the knowing mind and visual experience, light and shadow, color and form, and the active consciousness of seeing, seeing consciousness, and then doing the same when you're ready at each of the other sense doors. The ear receptors, the sound vibration, the knowing of those sound vibrations called hearing consciousness. And likewise, with the nose, fragrances, smelling consciousness, the tongue, flavors, tasting consciousness, the largest organ of our mind, body, the body, and the receptors in the skin and flesh of the body that receive the elemental sensations. So the body as receptor, and the elemental natures, textures, earth element, 
gathering, our cohesion, our fluidity, water element, changing temperatures, hot and cold, warm, cool, maybe noticing different parts of the body with different tem temperatures. As with the earth element, some areas hard, some areas soft. Body consciousness, our body knowing of these spectrums, hard, soft, warm, cool, fluid or collected, cohesive, and the air element, is the supporting element, how we can sit upright and not collapse, that quality of support or tension And along this spectrum of the air element is movement, oscillation, vibration, the subtlest to the most predominant, and how the mind gets quieter when we look for subtle earth element, softness, the subtle water element, the subtle temperature or fire element, subtle air element. Notice how the mind grows more relaxed and sees, senses, feels more from that relaxed stream of knowing, observing. The subtle and grosser, more predominant elemental nature of what it is when we refer to our body and then the body remembers our meditation posture, the recognition of that and allowing the body to feel its uprightness. How, how is the spine situated? We can't always feel the spine can be helpful to visualize the spine for some moments and then let go of the concept of that visual visualization and just feel what is there. It's likely to be very subtle, maybe fluid and subtle, soft and subtle, an even temperature between warmth and coolness. Likewise, washing awareness through the body where it feels blank or empty or absent or numb. You can visualize that area here in the heart, the heart solar plexus center, the center of chitta, consciousness. Visualize that area for a while. Let go of the visual, visualization and just feel what is there even if the sensation is still numb or blank or vague or subtle, 
It's always exactly as it should be. And turning awareness in on itself, recognizing that there's no project mentality, there's no doing, no agenda. Mindful awareness doesn't need anything. Visualizing the whole body, perhaps, from within the body, not through, filtered through the, the mind or thought formations, just the felt sense of body consciousness. Often, many of you find the whole body as an anchor, a home anchor for awareness, to rest, to start again if you've been lost, or as a source both for a resting anchor and in, uh, in observing, investigating awareness of what the body is, aside from the conceptual way we hold it, its actual elemental pulsing, vibrating nature. Or as many of you do at times, that area of the body that's reliable, safe, constant as an anchor, like the hands, one resting on the other, or however you place the hands, their extraordinary sensitivity serves as a reliable and consistent abiding of awareness, resting of mindfulness. And likewise, the feet can be useful And we learned how to ground ourselves by using the feet in formal meditation and their availability outside of formal meditation when we're moving about and simply remember awareness of feet and how, how grounding that is, stabilizing. It's fine to use the constancy of a home anchor, a primary anchor, such as the body or the rise and fall, expanding, contracting of the abdomen in breathing. It's also fine if other predominant phenomena arise like bird song, to either attend to it with full attention to the sound vibration at the ear door and see if you can differentiate between the thought or association of where, where the sound is coming from. Here, for example, I think it's birds, bird song. But to be with the reality is to let go of where we think the sound is coming from or what it is and just 
rest in the hearing consciousness, abiding with hearing vibration, sound vibration. That's the actual reality, free of the conceptual overlay. With each sense door, we discern between the mental projection of what we hear or see, our source of fragrance and taste, and the actual immediacy of the experience, the vibrating taste buds, fragrant moments, visual strobing light and shadow. And the body reality of just alternating play of the elemental natures and not pressure on the knee or aching in the back. And we're really mindful, we're not even sure where in the body a particular sensation is occurring. Just somewhere in space, there are sensations of pressure, tingling, aching, heat, softness, coolness, tension. We're leaning back in the moment. Leaning back on time. Entering that mythical time, meditation time that's not linear. Not logical. It's more liminal time. See for yourself.
Well, the talk is on um, awe, and grief, <laughs> equanimity in relationship to anicca, dukkha, and anatta. I want to begin with a, a just a little part of a song that George Harrison wrote in 1968 from the, I'm sure, I don't know if I have to explain who George Harrison is from the Beatles. Um, ah. <laughs> I look at the world and I notice it is turning while my guitar gently weeps. With every mistake, we must surely be learning. Still my guitar gently weeps. It always makes me weep. <laughs> so it's, I think it's a very powerful song. I think um, autumn for me is a very evocative season for coming to terms with impermanence, anicca, but also all of the uh, characteristics of existence, of the truth of things, the anicca, impermanence, dukkha, the unreliability of experience, and anatta, the uncontrollability of experience. I think that um, when we, wherever we grow up, I think the, the land has, and the water sky has such a powerful effect. And I think that um, particularly when there would be little animals that would die, but especially after my mom died, there was something about this ravishing beauty of the leaves in the trees in Massachusetts in autumn, uh, but they were dying. And so the, the maples, the red maples in the swamps, it, you know, my botany teacher taught me that the red maples, their feet get wet and cold uh, because the water in the swamps get cold first in the autumn. So they're the, usually the first leaves to turn, they get red. And then the, for me, particularly the sugar maples, the sh it was like the sugar maples would turn this extraordinary gold. It's probably happening right now from gold to this pure, pure, pure yellow. And it, it's like all the goodness of the um, spring and summer, all of its goodness, all of the warmth of the sun, it would just pour out of these leaves, would flow out to you, and, um, but they were dying. And I think even though I couldn't put it into words as a kid, but especially again after my mom's death, I, I would feel like there was something so deeply okay when I would lay on the earth and just look up and feel this um, flowing, life flowing back in the dying and in, in its beauty. Um, to know that something is deeply okay, that, that equanimity, that unconditional peace. And, and sometimes, um, well, usually both would happen with a beautiful leaf. It would, one leaf, uh, one, the end of the stem would, would uh, let go. And you could hear it if you were quiet, it would, it would go thaw, thaw, like a, you could hear one leaf die. And it would be so gradual and so beautiful the way it would drift down. Again, that sense that it was okay, right? And um, sometimes storms would come through and all the leaves would go at once, right? Like it just said so, so many different ways, but I think that I kind of organically felt this um, uncontrollability of change and the unreliability of it, but that there, that there was something that I would learn about non-attachment in that process. 
And I think that um, where I live now in Hawaii, it the changes might but not be so um, intense in that way, but that just to feel last year, um, I wasn't home all of October, went to um, British Columbia for a re to teach a retreat. Um, and often have not been here all of October. So I'm learning about the, the ways in which um, you start getting the flood advisories. <laughs> you know, there's more rain and you get the high surf advisories. Um, and you notice that the ocean currents are looking different and the winds are changing and different. And particularly, I think for me, the stars, um, when they're visible, it's so apparent because we're just in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, yeah? And it's just like you really feel that sense of, yeah, the Big Dipper is sinking. It's disappearing in, in the north right now. It's on, just after sunset. And the Scorpio is disappearing, you know? It's, uh, and it, it will seem like it's always going to be there. And then it's gone. Yeah, it's just so, it's so powerful, this anicca change. My uh, middle sister, uh, they call sisters like us Irish twins. Uh, we were so close in time of birth and uh, when I was 45, she, she got ovarian cancer. And she um, got chemotherapy for four years. And she and I had um, a lot of troubled times between us. Just it was, um, we took all the stress of, our, of what was going on, on. We took it out on each other. Um, and there was no one to intervene or, or help us. Um, and I don't know, like, if I could have ever imagined that we could heal so well without anything really spoken about it. We just um, started talking around sunset every night. She lived in Western Pennsylvania. Um, and it felt like there was just this, this understanding of the preciousness of human birth that the Buddha taught that like it wasn't said, but it was like just being together um, was enough. It was like that just didn't matter what we were talking about, but just, um, just being, just being together on the phone was healing. And one day, um, around four years into this process, I could feel her voice totally change, just like, you know, with that like leaf I described dropping off the tree like that. Her voice went just in the conversation, something shifted. And I could tell she went from being attached to being alive to um, letting go. It was so subtle, but it was so profound, this, this shift. And in two or three days, um, she died. And um, she, felt, it felt, she felt so complete, like something felt so total um, that I felt her just go, like just fly off. There was no residue. It was very moving. Um, And the healing between us happened without word. And sometimes I think that like when we notice these changes like in autumn that are like it's um, before winter, right? The death that happens in winter, um, that that kind of shock and splendor of the beauty of autumn um, can help us with this like awe, the awe of the beauty the, and the ravishing nature of that and the grief of the, the dying. Um, 
but also that we can learn the preciousness of all of life, the valuing of it, and that just being with this process is so much part of life and death. The last retreat that um, the 10 day online retreat that we taught, um, Darene gave a, a little talk on Sila and um, talked about non harming, not killing. And it, she was talking about not killing even just one little bug um, out of the great care of the preciousness of life, taking that great care. And a few nights later, um, I fell asleep with my light on. I'm doing that more <laughs> lately as I get older. I fall asleep with the light on. Uh, and I'm really asleep. It's not like I'm struggling. Um, and I, I woke up with all this stuff all over me. I didn't know what it was. And it was bugs. It was thousands and thousands. <laughs> of little bugs and my first thought was Darina going don't even every even the tiniest little bug don't, don't like I don't kill it and I'm like ah! it was so intense it was great uh, it's not always easy yeah when we're when we're when we're really sick or upset to or like just with the world in you know, the way things are it's like we it's not easy to always remember the preciousness of human birth or birth itself there's a meaningfulness in it that i love that george harrison song because it's like amidst it all with every mistake can we learn something it's so, um, it's so forgiving and so compassionate that we get that the meaningfulness of being here is to be liberated, <laughs> to go through the kar whatever karma is unfolding for us. This morning when I went for an early walk, um, my um, physical therapist has been trying to get me to walk farther and faster, but I tend to be slow. And, um, but I was very slow <laughs> earlier. Um, in, the, in the very slow times, which were a long time, uh, I had a little, spot that uh, I didn't want to look too weird to the neighbors, but oh well, you know, I wasn't going slow walking on the road, but I was going back and forth in this one area, very, very short area. So anybody who lived around there would think, you know, what is Michelle doing now, right? Um, but of course, I've done it so much, I don't think anybody really, it bothers them. And um, I was just kind of doing, going to do my regular walk. And I saw this kind of very far, I can see the ocean very far. I saw this, like the ocean looked like it was fluttering. The ocean looked like it had wings. Um, and I was just, it just stopped me. It just, it stopped my mind. It stopped my body, heart, mind. It, the not knowing what it was and the beauty of it. Uh, and then um, it turned out that these two white egrets, were, were making that incredible beauty and they flew toward me. And at some point I realized, oh, there, there's two birds flying. Um, and uh, it was a real gift because I just decided to do my old slow walk uh, and got very quiet. So I, as I was walking down the hill, this little hill um, back and forth, um, it's been very dry, as you've heard us talk about. It's been very dry, but it rained a lot recently. And uh, my old, old, long lost friend, the dragonfly that I haven't seen in so long, Tomo, he's an old friend. He just started 
coming with me. So he did this whole back and forth for like 40 minutes with me, hovering with along with me. Um, and it was such a powerful um, feedback about how important it is to, to slow down. Maybe not all the time, of course, my, um, they want my heart rate to go up apparently. <laughs> But it was so, it's so great. And I, I felt like, um, because I kept staying with it, staying with it, that I could really see how awe, like this awe that we can experience, the wonder, um, that it just naturally shifts to gratitude. It's a genuine gratitude for, again, it's, it's not, it doesn't require a lot of words, but it's just that just being just being walking and the, the instructions. It's like just, just being aware of hearing without the extra overlay of a description, right? That's the instructions you get, gave or seeing or feeling the hands, our hands or our feet touching the ground. I read about a new book called The Golden Mole and Other Living Treasures by Catherine Rundell. And um, in the book, this is part she wants to ban, she wants to ban trawler fishing. It, it trawler fishing kills seahorses. So she wrote. We should wake in the morning, and as we put on our trousers, we should remember the seahorses, and we should scream with, we should scream with awe, and not stop screaming until we fall asleep, and the same the next day, and the next. I'm not sure there's even anything to say about that, except that it's extraordinarily beautiful. And you think of so much senseless harming, yeah, and then just to, to, to try to I think that's why I love George Harrison's song, you know, that his guitar is weeping in that, in, with that range of the world turning and how it's unfolding. And we need equanimity so much. Yeah, there, there's a, a just deep acceptance of how things are, but to not, that's not coming from, that deep acceptance is not coming from not wanting to feel, not wanting to be open or sensitive, but it's coming from that deep wisdom that's infusing the openness of heart. And that screaming with awe reminded me somehow of, um, something that the great poet Adrienne Rich wrote. She said, there must be those among us whom we can sit down with and weep and still be counted as warriors. There must be those among us whom we can sit down with and weep and still be counted as enlightened. The other day I was uh, washing something out in the sink that had gotten had fallen in the mud in the rain and uh, I finally had time to rinse it in the sink. Uh, and you know, when you um, pull the plug out, you've rinsed, you know, you're, you're washing it and it's like you pull the plug and it's amazing. All the water kind of goes down the drain and the 
the dirt, the sand, the mud is there, and it's like your cloth is clean. And um, I think of that as life, like with the practice, with our practice, with the practice, no matter what, it's like this, it's like a grand purification if you're paying attention to it. It's that's awesome too, right? It's not just this beauty, but the awe, awe of it all, the awe of us being able to really connect with anger about the suffering in the world or say anything about whatever pain and to know we can connect with that and be with that not not get repelled by it not get attached to it but to like let that move through like a great storm and to come to peace with it to get liberated that's awesome And I, I think um, it's so easy for us to lose our connection to our own goodness. Yeah, it's, it's so easy to lose this connection to the preciousness of life. It, it's like somehow I think these times we're living in, it's almost like the design is to... to um, get us more and more aware of how important it is to find the goodness in our bodies and minds and hearts, you know, to, to practice the Brahma Viharas, the loving kindness, the compassion, the empathetic joy or awe, the acceptance, the unconditional acceptance peace. So the Brahma Viharas, the design is to help us find our goodness, to hold on to our goodness. There's a great book, fairy tale, fairy tale by George MacDonald called The Princess and the Goblin. And the princess, um, her uh, kar karma is um, that there's a grand plan for the goblins too kidnap her and she in the book it's it's over halfway through she she runs into the first first goblin that run runs after her and attacks her and um, she has a invisible grandmother great great grandmother up in the attic that nobody knows about um, that's there spinning this thread uh for for when things get worse for it's like a thread out of spider webs from far away uh, that she's going to help her grand great 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 granddaughter um, help her find her way with so it's going to be so fine so strong it's going to be invisible so she's up, she's been up in the attic for a long time spin you know spinning this stuff it's taking a long time um Um, so it's about time to give her this thread, uh, but she wants the great granddaughter who's just been attacked and is all muddy and dirty to go take a bath. And so she she makes a bath for her great grand great 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 granddaughter, and um, she tells her to go look in the bath. And she she does, and she asks her what she sees, and she said, "I see the sky and the moon." and the stars, it looked as if there was no bottom to it. And then she, the grandmother asked her to wait there till she gets this very, very small um, ball of thread she's been spinning for years. And she asked her to sit quietly. So her, her, the, the great, granddaughter's name is Irene. So the story goes, Irene sat down in the low chair and her grandmother left her, shutting the door behind her. The girl sat gazing, now at the rose fire, now at the starry walls, now at the silvery light. And a great quietness came over her heart.
If all the long-legged goblins in the whole world had come rushing helter-skelter at her then, she would not have been afraid of them for a single moment. How this was, however, she could not tell. She only knew there was no fear in her and everything was so right and safe that it could not get in. We can use a lot of words for equanimity, but that's the feeling of it. And we practice and practice. It's like we can practice karuna, care, kindness, like so much that we really do start infusing our body with it. It's like it can come into our heart center, like Steve was describing our heart center, or it can come through our eyes. It can come through our skin. It can come into our belly. But it's like there's, an, there's the idea that there's an awareness field of care, and it's not located anywhere. But we can start finding it. It's like an invisible thread. You start finding it somewhere. It could be for sadness, right? It could be for, it could be for a thought. It could be for an emotion, a body sensation, a sound. And it could maybe only last a few seconds. But this accessing this goodness is um, how we're not going to sink and how we'll get liberated. Because it helps us connect, connect and value our goodness and the preciousness of this birth and why we're here to get liberated, to be kind. And in that way, as we learn to access this, we start to have a choice, right? So that grief may come up or anger might come up or hopelessness might come up or however, right? Loneliness might come up, um, but we have a choice to care about it, to be kind, to understand that it's not referring back to a me or an I or a mine. Mm. There's a, um, a word in Japanese for um, the begging bowl. So the Buddha begged for food, right? He begged for alms with a begging bowl and all the monks and nuns learn to beg for their food each day with a begging bowl. Such dependency, yeah. Such amazing dependency. And the word means in Japanese, just enough. So in the context of that, of course, that what you receive in that bowl is meant to be, it's just enough, right? And I think that's a really important phrase because often we have this idea, like, is it good enough, right? Am I good enough? Or is this moment good enough? Or are, is somebody else good enough? Or is this moment in time on the planet, this time period, is it good enough? But maybe it's just enough. You know, maybe it's, it's like with every mistake, some of us, hopefully, at least, are still learning. While our guitar gently weeps, yeah. But it's like, is it, is it this choice again to go from, it's not good enough, I'm not good enough, this isn't good enough, to maybe it's just enough. Maybe this breath right now, maybe the, you notice the breath, one breath now. 
you can see the difference between if you ask if it's good enough or if it's just enough. I have a friend that um, wrote me something this morning by email. And he had a, um, a dear friend in Dharamsala in India that um, was taking like medical care of a Tibetan monk there. And he noticed as this monk was walking away from him after the treatment that he was saying, I am sacred, I am sacred, I am sacred, I am sacred. Um, but there was a typo on, in the email that he sent me. So what, it act, what he sent was, <laughs> I am scared, I am sacred, I am scared, I am sacred. And I... I thought about it and I was like, I tried it for a while. I was walking around going, I'm scared, I'm sacred. And I'm like, that's really cool. Like, <laughs> that like covers it, right? That's great. And, um, but then I thought, maybe I shouldn't talk about this until in the talk, because I, I felt like it was so great. And um, I wrote back and I said, is that a typo? Or is that like the what he said? And he said, no, he was really upset that he had done it. He said, no, it's I am sacred, I am sacred. But I really thought it was such a good, um, at least a choice, right? Like you have a choice if you're feeling afraid, you could say, I'm, I'm afraid, I am sacred, yeah. Our bodies, how do we treat them? How do we even treat the fear? It's like sacred. What planet are we on when we just like hate all these things that are part of our nature? So I'd like to end with a part of um, the Navajo creation chant. It is lovely indeed. It is lovely indeed. I, I am the spirit within the earth. The feet of the earth are my feet. The legs of the earth are my legs. The strength of the earth is my strength. The thoughts of the earth are my thoughts. The voice of the earth is my voice. The feather of the earth is my feather. All that belongs to the earth belongs to me. All that surrounds the earth surrounds me. I, I am the sacred works of the earth. It is lovely indeed. It is lovely indeed.
Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi. On the other side of the island. <laughs> We're getting rain here too. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, thank you so much. Um, kind of like everything I've needed to hear today. Um, <clears throat> I've been taking care of a, a friend um, for about the last six months uh, who has had dementia. And uh, he passed away on, on Wednesday. And um, I related a lot to the, you know, I am scared, I am sacred, I am scared, I am sacred. Because there were so many times during the caregiving that um, I felt I was doing something wrong. I was afraid of my reactions. I was afraid of the expectations that I had of how he was going to react. Um, he, he's someone who's been very, very important to me since I moved here to Hawaii. And, um, but yet there were times when I felt that there was goodness in you know, what, what I was doing with him and, and being with him, just to be with him and sit you know, like what you were talking about with your sister, you know, it's just, there were times when we were just sitting next to each other and it just felt so the way it just was supposed to be. I, I um, so, but then since, um, since Wednesday, I've been feeling so many different things, you know, I've, I've been feeling like I'm lost I feel confused, I feel some joy, I feel gratitude, probably more than anything, you know, there's just a lot of gratitude. Um, and I'm staying connected, you know, you know with his wife and, and um, his family who were all there, you know, when he took his last breath. And, um, so I don't know, I, I, one thing I wanted to say too is that um, I would listen to, I would take my computer with me, you know, over to his house and, and we'd listen to Dharma talks. And there was one that you had done that um, I wanted him to, uh, you know, to watch. And um, it was the one where you were talking about the potholes you know, at the, um, at the farmer's market. And it, I just, I got such a kick out of that, you know, because that was kind of like what it was like, you know, sometimes, you know, it's just, uh, I'd be wondering, you know, well, why is he doing this? You know, and I didn't tell him this is why I wanted him to watch it. But... And then, you know, then the thought was, you know, there were, there were times I did the exact same thing, you know, he, he would get angry, sometimes I would get angry, you know, and it was just, it was just, after a while, you know, we just kind of thought, you know, it's okay, we can laugh at this stuff, you know, let's have some humor around it, you know, there were times when he would call me Dave or Jeremy, <laughs> or, you know, Michael, and I'd say, Mark, you know? <laughs> oh yeah, Mark, you know. <laughs> And, um, and, but I also really appreciated, you know, when you were telling the story about, you know, driving around the cemetery, you know, with your sister in the back seat <laughs> and your dad, you know, and, and that desire to just not keep doing the same thing, you know, and having the same behavior, you know, it's just, um, so anyway, I, I think most of all, I, I, I don't, I come to this often and I don't really share about what's going on. And I, I really felt, um, just so much gratitude for this Sangha and for my friend, Tom. So, and I'm, and I'm just allowing myself to be okay with whatever comes up, you know, and not kind of expecting that it's supposed to be a certain way because <laughs> I know it's not it's just 
it's going to be what it is. And I'm, I, I'm so grateful for the practice that has helped me to be able to come to a particular place to recognize that and, and let go. So thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, Mark, you sound fantastic. So I, you know, that it's it's only um, what I could just share is just that it's the most important thing is that you don't have any kind of um, idea how you should be. You're you're saying that, but I would just encourage you that um, the, the a death like this is like a bomb goes off in your heart. It's like a bomb goes off and and it's just um, nothing else really to say about it other than kind of everything that you could possibly experience will come up um, in that process. It's so purifying. It's so, I mean, it's uh, the best teacher. And it's so hard when you can't, take care of somebody perfectly that's dying. It, you just can't and you get frustrated and you, you have to face your limits. You have to face the limits of the person you're taking care of. And um, it's very humbling. And so, you know, learning humor out of that one is the best, yeah. I don't know, Steve, do you have anything to add? Oh, can't hear you. Can't hear you. I, I don't really have anything to add, except I really heard in the story how it ev evolved into what I hear now that you're resting largely in gratitude. I think that's extraordinary. Thank you for sharing that. Catalina. Hi. Hi. Thank you so beautiful for this talk today. Um, it comes exactly at the same time. I have also a death in my family. Uh, and the sad part is that uh, it was a young, my, my nephew, 33 years old. And it's so awful. He felt. Um, in the Alps, Alps, he fell rock climbing, so he died. And we are devastated and I'm trying to hold him there and I'm trying to like accept because there is nothing else that we can do, we just accept. And and I'm doing a lot of meditation and walking, 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 walking to try to calm myself. And one one of my questions is, um, um, I have been with a meditation, I have been able to arrive to places of very serenity and equanimity and and very but it's a lot of discipline, you know, like using a lot of discipline um, and forcing, quasi forcing myself and not having thoughts and with a big effort of no thoughts, no thoughts and breathing and everything. And I, I, I am able to arrive to places of very, very quiet. And, um, but I don't know if that 
is like I know like Deepama is like no thought don't use thoughts that's it and I said well why not let's try and it works if you are protected you know if you are but but at the same time in when you are dealing with so many things um it's it's um having that discipline is hard but at the same time i i think that is possible but with a lot of effort so i want to give your feedback is something that i really should still be driving for and and working on that knowing that do really bring me to a place of quietness and um so i just wanted to hear your feedback about this <laughs> i th it sounds like you're doing incredible i mean really it's just a uh... Uh, for the older people, someone dying so young is very hard to accept. It's just, it's not natural. We, it's just not, it's not something that, um, it just goes against everything in our heart. So I just want to make sure I say that, that it's just uh, much harder to accept. Um, when my mom died when I was really young, I found a, a part of a poem. I've never been able to find it since uh, by Li Po, uh, the great Chinese poet from long ago. And he, in it, he said, uh, huh, an early end is not fate's hurry. And I wrote it down because I said it to myself a lot. An early end is not fate's hurry, meaning that somehow this was the, his time to go, even though it's, it goes against like every, it's, there's a great rebellion again against it in us. But I think that, that I would recommend you write it down because it really helps to just be reminded that, of that, that it, that, that it doesn't make sense in our head but it 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 did happen um and then in terms of thoughts um uh, getting quiet of course what you're doing sounds great but you can also turn on it and look and just be have meta for thoughts so instead of thinking they should disappear or get quiet also you can just change the whole perspective and just be kind to the thoughts that are happening and and get some space so that you go to sound, you go to hands, you go to feet, and then you can just find the place in your body that you perceive the thoughts or outside your body. But often for most of us, we perceive thoughts somewhere in our head. And sometimes you just need to really just go, oh, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, you know, you can say, it's okay, quiet, but be kind, whatever words help you, I care about you, I care about you, um, but it's, it, um, you, the idea is that you're not trying to stop the flood of thinking, but you are trying to um, find some spaciousness within it and kindness within it and so that you're not believing them all so you know and of course it's very difficult it's, I again I think I admire how well you're doing you're doing great um, but anyway I think sometimes just remembering we can touch our head like and it's just like a I sometimes when in many retreats I remember just taking my head off I used to pretend I'd take my head off and just have it in my on my heart like a, a little baby, just say it's shh, it's okay, it's okay, like <laughs> instead of shut up, <laughs> you know, shut up, you know. <laughs> we're just kind of okay, we're just gonna take this thing off and give it a little time out, you know. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry that this happened. I don't, um, 
going to take a while. It's, this is a big bomb. There's bombs and then big bombs. This is like a huge bomb. Like if you picture like a, a lake or a pond, you know, ocean, but something goes off like that, it's, um, it has so much power and um, it's the best thing to learn from, but the hardest. Steve, do you have anything? Um, it, it is hard in this case because in in Mark's case, he had the he had the privilege of serving this person, knowing what the end would be, and being able to be a part of it and experience no less grief, but being a part of it and having the, uh, the privilege of serving um, really helped that grief to become gratitude. In your situation, it might take some other process to reach that gratitude. I, I'm sure the love for this person, it can also be experienced as gratitude, but right now it's probably experienced as loss, you know, and unexpected and a huge absence and loss. But I, I have a feeling that because of your practice, you will find ways in which you you feel of service, you'll feel motivated by compassion because of because of him and who he was, who he was to you, and that that compassion will itself become the gratitude for having him in your life. And then, and it was an unexpected, as Michelle said, a, a huge bomb. And there's, there was no sense of any end coming as with Mark's process. Uh, and so we just have to, we have to live with those kinds of sudden absences, sudden loss, unexpected loss. And, and where in that can you find the peace and gratitude, you know, and, and how will you, how will you keep that remembrance alive in ways that doesn't feel like it, it shouldn't have happened. Thank you, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I might add one more thing, which is you might have a place like outside or in your home, but when somebody's that like not there, um, I think sometimes it's nice to just have a little altar or something. I don't know if you do, but something inside or out or I even no, I, I I I haven't done that as as I say, like I have been it's just in nature. Mm -hmm. walking 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 right, but right. not stopping walking like two or three days walking, <laughs> walking, walking, walking. there might be a spot outside that you just like <laughs> stop and kind of have a little place for for him yes yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah i will i will i great. will great do that thank you <laughs> thank you
just after um, somebody dies, it's a wonderful time to actually do metta or compassion. So, you know, Mark for Tom or Catalina, you know, it's, it's a very important, powerful time. And uh, I think for all of us with any great loss or there's a lot going on for so many people right now. It's really to remember that um, you hold, you kind of hold on to their goodness and their, the preciousness of their life by staying connected through loving kindness or compassion. And sharing your merit. That's what sharing merit is all about. I was wondering, Steve, if you might want to um, just end the sitting, the time together with a little sharing of the merit. If you don't want to, that we can 86 the idea. <laughs> a little, just a little bit. Feels like the right time. <laughs> The simplest way to do this kind of meditation uh, that I learned the best when uh, Chandra, our daughter, and I were pouring my dad's ashes into the Irrawaddy River from a boat as we went by the Sagain Hills. And a, and a Burmese man was um, translating a, a chant that that ten nuns were doing, which was all about sharing merit, really. Uh, and, and every time the nuns paused, the Burmese man would r remark that that sharing mer sharing merit really works and kept saying, it really does work. It really reaches people wherever they are, living or departed, and it really helps them in body and mind. And the nuns would chant again, and then they would pause, and uh, the Burmese friend would say, it really works. Both in body and mind, living or departed, it really works. So with this kind of confidence, um, we, we don't have to do anything we haven't already done. We just have to appreciate uh, or acknowledge all the giving we've ever done. Like all my acts of dana throughout my life uh, and all my acts of selfless love or kindness throughout my life and, and all, all the selfless wisdom I've had in moments where it was really needed. Together, this punya, it's called. Punya meaning the accumulation and collected powerful, positive energy from dana, generosity, metta, and all the Brahma Viharas, and panya, selfless, liberating wisdom. 
made this accumulated powerful positive energy support these beings I care so much about in my life, living or departed. May it support them in body and mind, wherever they are on their journey to liberation. You can just do, do that anytime you want, or as a longer meditation, you know, start with someone important to you, close to you, that you're feeling right now, and then just expand that to other family, friends, community, you know, up to the whole world or throughout the universe. I share the merit of my um, Donna, Sila, and Panya, um, my good actions of generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom to all beings everywhere. May it support them in body and mind wherever they are on their journey to full freedom, liberation. It really works. Hope you have a good week and hold on to your goodness. May we be liberated. See you next Sunday, I hope. <laughs>